When using any modern day's operating system, you typically don't need to care for CD-ROM support as it's built in. That's also true for FreeDOS, which installs things from the get-go, so you can use the CD-ROM drive right away. But how exactly is it with all the legacy DOS releases, such as MS-DOS or PC-DOS? This was exactly the question I received a few days ago. So, let's look into configuring a historic DOS to make use of a CD-ROM drive. Obsolete computer technology is my passion. I'm the vintage collector and these are my stories. This episode is sponsored by PCBWay.com, your source for CNC machining, 3D printing, PCBs and more. The original MS-DOS and its flavor IBM DOS go back to as late as 1980 when Tim Patterson, then still working for Seattle Computer Products, developed the initial release under the name of QDOS, the quick and dirty operating system. Initially, not much more than a CPM clone made up to run on the 8080 line of Intel CPUs, QDOS eventually was bought by Microsoft through the course of July 1981 and rebranded MS-DOS. And while MS-DOS evolved through the years, it is still very archaic compared to modern days operating systems and in order to use a CD-ROM drive, some manual configuration steps must be undertaken. As we can see here, there's no trace to be seen about the CD-ROM drive in Microsoft Diagnostics. Also, the CD-ROM drive, even though connected to an IDE port and well detected by the BIOS, doesn't register as a hard drive, as FDIS clearly tells us here. So, in order to use a CD-ROM on the old MS-DOS and IBM DOS, you need drivers. Gary, I know you are very excited and in fact know quite a bit about CD-ROM technology. Why do you get so excited about this one? Well, I think, Stuart, the thing that's really interesting is it's a brand new medium for publishing, basically what you get. It's based upon uh, the same, exactly the same technology as CD-Audio, and it's very high capacity. Now, the CD-ROM standard exists since 1983, although it would still take a few years to arrive in the mass market. On the present day, CD-ROM drives are long surpassed by CD-DVD combo drives, which again were surpassed by CD-DVD Blu-ray combo drives, and typically they are connected via USB or SATA. Before that, from around the mid-90s onwards, the preferred interface of choice was the ID interface in the mass markets, whereas the CD-ROM drives were using the ANTA PI protocol. Also, the SCSI interface was widely used in the segment of professional workstations. Speaking of ATA PI, which means ATA Packet Interface, this was invented to encapsulate and transport SCSI commands to the devices connected onto the ATA IDE bus. This allowed for not only connecting traditional hard drives, but also tape streamers, SIP drives, CD-ROM drives and much more. This standardization simplified things greatly, as before that, nothing else than hard drives could be attached to the ATA bus. CD-ROM drives for that matter, if not connected to a SCSI bus, often were attached to proprietary controllers like this Sony CDU 31 a which I had myself back in the days. Other times, sound cards like the Creative Sound Plus 16 brought the CD-ROM interface along. However, that was not an IDE ATA interface, even though it used the same 40-pin cables. The interface was proprietary to Panasonic, so it would not work with later years ATA PI compliant CD-ROM drives. The reason for connecting CD-ROM drives to a sound card was simple. Firstly, ATA PI was not yet standardized. Secondly, many pre-mid-90s systems did only have one ID port allowing for one master and one slave device. Going with a connector on the sound card allowed for connecting the CD-ROM as a third device in case both ID ports were already occupied. And this is where my episode sponsor for today, PCBWay, comes into play. 
PCBWay offers a wide range of services around CNC machining, PCB production, including full assembly services and 3D printing on over a dozen of prototyping materials. When joining PCBWay first time, you'll benefit from a one-time $5 welcome voucher. Use the link in the video description below to join up with PCBWay. I'd love to demonstrate the pre auto pi standard drives, as I have this Soundblaster 16 card available, but no matching drives that would go with these two connectors either by the Mitsumi or the Panasonic standard. So I'll be focusing on an Auto PI compliance either on drive for now and show you how to configure it in MS-DOS 6. So as noted before, you need a device driver. Obscure enough, MS-DOS came already with MSCDX.exe, the CD-ROM extensions driver. However, this is basically just a file system redirector service, but not an actual device driver. As noted in DOS help, it still needs a vendor specific device driver. I happen to have a variety of CD-ROM driver files as you can see here. Most of them work interchangeably, so there's not really a need to use a vendor specific driver in most cases, at least when it comes to the Arta PI drives. However, the ones which in my experience work for the broadest variety of drives out there are the LG.sys and the OakCDROM.sys drivers. For this showcase, I'm going right away into the MS-DOS 6 setup. Let's speed that up quickly. In the end, I'll have a vanilla MS-DOS 6 here, which doesn't know anything about CDROM drives in its default configuration. I'll start by simply copying over all the sys files to a new directory in C colon backslash cd-rom. The default config.sys file is not really optimized. As I don't like waiting for the memory test, I'll disable the high memory test using the testmen colon off parameter. I'll also briefly add emm386 with the no ems parameter so I get the upper memory blocks for loading drivers high. Doing so, I'll change this one here to read device high, so setware loads into memory space above 640 kilobytes. As for the CD-ROM driver, I use the LG.sys drive for now. Note the drive designation with the slash D parameter, which reads CD-ROM001. We'll need that one again in a moment. Last but not least, I'll add the last drive statement, putting it to Z, so DOS supports the maximum amount of drive letters available. Now, I know that pre-assigning drive letters takes additional memory, but it's not too much, and I have my reasons for doing so as you'll see in a moment. So here is the autoexec.bat, into which I'm adding the already mentioned MSCDX. The LH statement forces it to load above 640 kilobytes as well, so will conserve some memory below the 640 kilobytes barrier. Note that I used the same drive designation I set before in config to sys, the CD-ROM001. Using the slash L parameter, I ask MSCDX to assign the drive letter Z for the CD-ROM. This is my own personal quirk, as I want the removable drives always to be the last ones in the system, so drive letters won't change if I'm adding anything about new hard drives and partitions and such. I'll also activate Smart Drive to provide a disk cache of 2 MB. This also applies for recaching on the CD-ROM and can improve performance massively. And while so far I used the virtual machine in virtual box, this works the very same way on the real machine. And if you're wondering about the real drive speed, you can use the CD speed utility to assert the benchmark numbers for your drive. But let's also look into this one, which is an Adaptec 2940 SCSI controller. How does this one work on the DOS with a CD-ROM drive? SCSI on DOS is a different beast. 
any SCSI hard drives register natively to the system via Interop 13 hex, so won't require any drivers in order to work on the DOS. But for other peripherals like CD-ROM drives, that's not the case. Adaptex still offers the DOS drivers for download to this day. I need to add the matching driver for the 2914 adapter, which in this case is the ASPI8DOS.sys file. SCSI CD-ROMs need an ASPI driver, which in this case is the ASPI-CD.sys. Still, it takes the same syntax for registering the CD-ROM drive with the unique identifier that will be referred to MSCDX in autoexec.bat as well. On startup, not only do we see the CD-ROM drive properly detected on the SCSI BIOS, but later again when both the ASPI8DOS.sys and the ASPI-CD.sys drivers are loaded. And here again, it works like a charm loading up my Sound Blaster AWE64 driver CD and even running the CD speed benchmark. Having said that, what's the oldest version of DOS to support CD-ROM drives? Here I'm booting DOS version 3.31 using the same set of SCSI drivers. And voila, it all is properly detected and ready for use. But that's not the oldest DOS release yet, it goes back to MS-DOS 3.1, which came in 1985 and was actually the first to support local area networks. Wait a minute, you're talking about CD-ROM drives, not local area networks. Correct, but said MSCDX file system redirector actually sort of cheating. It doesn't really make a CD-ROM drive available as a native block device in DOS. Instead, it hooks into the network API and maps the CD-ROM drive to a drive letter like any ordinary network drive. Cool, huh? As you saw, it's no big thing after all to get a CD-ROM drive working on MS-DOS, even on the rather ancient release 3.31 of 1987. And as you saw, whether it's ARTA PI or SCSI, it's basically the same setup. I would have loved though to investigate into the CD-ROM drives attached to a sound card, although, as mentioned before, I don't have any one of these at my disposition at the time. So long, I'm the Vintage Collector and this was my story for today. Thanks for watching and see you again next time. If you check out this channel's community tab, you'll find some polls on potential upcoming videos. You're very welcome to upvote on upcoming topics or drop in new ones you'd like me to chase down.